Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of the Podiatry Legends Podcast. With me today is another legend all the way from Illinois. It is Dr. Peter Lovato, DPM, and he is a partner at Northern Illinois Foot and Ankle Specialist. Now, if that business name seems familiar, it's because his partner, Dr. Patrick McEnney, has been on the podcast, I think it's five or six times, and every episode has been a hit. And also, one of their associates, Remy Stackus has been on the podcast as well. So, Pete, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. And yeah, it's taken me a while to uh, get you too. It has been. It's been, a, it's been a whirlwind the past few years. I had a couple of kids and obviously you broached on the partnership and our business has taken off, especially anybody listening that's seen Dr. McEnany's talk kind of knows that when we started, it was... What was it? Eight, eight years ago, seven years ago. I'm yeah. starting to date myself now, but we were just him and I in one office in Cary. And now we're up to about, we've consolidated down to, I think, 14 offices and almost 20 docs, but it's been a whirlwind. So yeah, so what was it's it? been like a I, busy I, few years. I met you last year when I was over, mm -hmm. I was in Milwaukee and then I caught a train down and we all went and had dinner together, which was fun. And, and at the time I didn't realize you were a partner, I only just found out about it that you're actually a partner and I just thought my god you guys all get on so well for people it's like a boss sort of employee type thing but I thought mm -hmm. you guys are like a well-oiled machine now knowing that you're a partner it makes perfect sense but even Remy's not a partner yet but he just fits in with you guys so well it's amazing yeah, don't tell him, but he's probably next up. It's not like we're recording this or anything. <laughs> no, he doesn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, and we were talking off. Yeah, he doesn't yeah. listen to this. Yeah, he doesn't. But, <laughs> but no, we were talking offline and it matters to us. I was saying it sounds cliche, but it, it, teamwork matters. And yeah. especially this day and age with how difficult it, it is to retain any employee, especially docs and with how long it very well, how long it takes to even credential them and recruit them. I, I remember sitting in a, Becker's healthcare, when we were looking into, I, I sit on a med exec board and the governing board for a surgery center. And I was, I was speaking at Becker's healthcare and they do an ASC conference. And I was listening to one of the orthopedic docs and he was saying, if we got to look two, three, four, five years down the line. We can't just yeah. say our so-and-so is going to retire next year. We got to go. It takes three years for us to recruit a joint surgeon. And okay. I just kind of thought about that. I said, Wow. Okay. My next question was, how do you figure out, you never really know when, you know, some of your older successful docs are going to retire and how do you succession plan? I mean, cause that's mm. something we're looking into right now because we have a mix of some of the younger docs that, you know, are coming out of residency and are fresh and energetic and want to get their numbers and do all the, do all the newer surgeries. And then some of the older docs that have been there for a while and are going to be leaving soon and having their own joint replacements. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, you know, we literally, that's not uh, to go off topic, funny. but two docs that told us, we just had two docs that told us, Hey, we're going to have knee replacements and they're both going to do it around the same time in December, our busiest month of the year. And it's, it's a curveball. So it's stuff yeah. you got to roll with. But what he told me was they develop a plan where, and it was a unique, interesting thought process. They developed a succession plan where they basically said, all right, when you give us your five-year heads up, you no longer take call. Yeah. And that's huge in our business, right? Especially orthopedics. I was a hybrid orthopedic and podiatric surgery trained and along with some other specialties in, in orthopedic surgery, call is everything, but it gets fatiguing. Right. As you get older and you want to keep practicing and making money and doing what you love, but you don't want the overnight call anymore. So these guys look at it as, all right, I'm going to give my five years. I'm not going to have to take call. But then they get a realistic idea of when these guys are going to leave. Is that how you got it figured out that when they say, I'm not going to be on call anymore, that's it. They've pretty much told and it's you. It's a five-year timeline. It's, it's yeah. a five-year timeline. And I'm basically- That's how they do it. That's how they do it. We're still trying to figure out how we want to do it with our practice moving yeah. forward and incentivize people to give you a real timeline. No one really has to give you a, a realistic idea. They can decide when they want to retire. Life mm. happens. But it's good for themselves that they can actually really think about it. They go, you know what? Yeah, I'm 55 now. I want to stop when I'm 60. Or I'm 60, I want to stop when I'm 65. And they throw the hand up and uh, yeah, they call it. I think it's a good yeah. idea. And that gives everybody in your team an idea. Thing is not on call anymore, which means he's heading right. out of the pasture. Yeah. But he's got five years right. to figure it out. 
Yeah, that's, that's obviously just one example, but it was an interesting thought. But, you know, I don't know about you, I, Patrick Mackinan, he, he's a little yeah. jackrabbit and a Tasmanian devil all rolled into one. You oh, know, yeah, I, yeah. I don't ever see him slowing down unless he absolutely has to. But that's one thing I love about our profession is we never really have to stop. You can stop doing surgery. You can just practice in the clinic. You can go down to a couple days a week and take eight weeks of vacation as you go to the end of your career. And honestly, you don't have to worry so much about retirement because you can slow down and go to a couple of days. And, and that's one thing that we have within our practice is we have some older docs that they see patients two days a week and they take two months of vacation a year and they love it. <laughs> yeah, It yeah, sounds awesome, right. right? And you're well aware how much we work and you know yeah. how many patients we see a week and surgeries we do and call we take and then managing the business on the side is another full-time job. It's a lot of hours. I, when I'm asked that question, it's more do I think I could just stop? No, I don't really think I could just stop. Maybe temporarily, but I would come back to it. Would I work as many hours? Probably not. <laughs> like, would I take more vacation? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but it's the drive. <laughs> it's the thing that's got me to this point. I, I don't know how to stop. I, it's the pursuit of perfection. Even if you don't, we never get to perfection, but it's the pursuit that drives us, or at least me. So I don't know. There was a quote I read somewhere, or it was an event that I was at, and somebody was talking, and they were talking about oh, th there's no such thing as perfection. They said it's more of limiting errors is what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. so as you get more experience, it's not about you become perfect. You be get the ability of making less errors each mm -hmm. time you actually do something. So you can always just keep getting better at, at what you're actually doing, but there'll never be absolute perfection. Yeah. No, it's, that's why it's the pursuit of perfection, right? You're always striving to be as good as you can, but you're never going to actually get there. And that's how you stay motivated. So I've got a question about your partnership. When you first became a partner with Patrick, how many clinics were there at the time then? So at the time, just a handful. I don't remember the exact number, but we were slowly building the way we started to grow the business. Carrie was our first clinic. We started as Carrie Grove Foot and Ankle Specialists, and it was it was the two of us. We had another associate that ended up leaving. So for a while, it was just us. And then we ended up adding a couple more people, and we did a build-out on our second office. And he'll probably tell you the same thing, but it'll be the last build-out we ever do. It took about a year and a half. <laughs> yeah, It's a gorgeous office, don't get me wrong. It's where I spend most of my time right now in Lake in the Hills, but it was a nightmare. You're literally picking faucets out and light fixtures and the color of walls and the color of the carpet and everything. It was just, it was a huge undertaking, but we got to make the office the way we wanted to make it. And it was the, not the traditional dark old podiatry clinic where, yeah. you know, you, you, you look like you're going to go and get your, your toenails trimmed, which, Hey, we, we still do that. And, and I love doing it. And I, I respect the hell, heck out of anybody that does, but we also have the feel of an orthopedic group because we do a lot of surgery. We, we put people in casts, we take x-rays and that's, we're more of a rounded practice and we can, I routinely tell people we'll, I'll see anything below the knee. It's except arteries and veins. I leave that up to yeah. the cardiologist. I'll do pretty much anything other than that. Um, yeah. It's so. interesting. You talk about the, the fit out though. That was one of the things I enjoyed the most every time I set up a new clinic was the building of it. It's the picking of the things, the color, the light things, just getting this thing looking schmick. Yeah, looking really Oh, so true. you're one of those guys. Yeah, oh, I loved it. Nuts. Absolutely, absolutely <laughs> I'm not an it. interior decorator. Okay. Oh, no, like I'm definitely I, you know, no I'm, interior decorator. I'm good decorator. at a few things. I'm not good at that. No, I'd let, like my wife a bit was probably yeah, far better at picking all that sort of stuff out, but I enjoyed the process of starting a clinic from scratch that zero patients and then just building it. Oh, I just got such a kick out of doing it. Yeah. So that part I like, like that yeah. part I like the whole building the practice and building relationships and going, getting out in the community. It's becoming harder and harder. You're starting to see physicians that don't want to do lunches anymore. There yeah. are more and more people that are employed by the hospital and, and aren't referral generated that just don't want to spend the time. Don't we'll try and set up dinners where we invite primary care doctors and try to do even educational things. In our area, a lot of the primary care docs don't really understand how successful total anchor replacements are. They're still thinking 10, 20 years in the past. 
everything's a fusion. And <laughs> most people that, right, most people that get sent to me, it's for opinion for a fusion. An anchor placement is probably a better bet for you, even though you're in your 50s or 60s with the technology the way it is. It's like pulling teeth just to get people to come out for a bite to eat nowadays. And it didn't used to be like that. Yeah, you know, I, I think I it has changed. Definitely has changed. Yeah. yeah. So, well, so the landscape's with, changing. Yeah. <laughs> and when you were talking about your team and like finding like people to come and join your team, because over here in Australia, that's, it's like this massive problem. And I always feel sometimes it's like a self fulfilling prophecy. If people keep saying there's a shortage of podiatrists or I can't find a decent podiatrist to work for me, mm -hmm. I sometimes wonder. Are you actually putting it out there and therefore that's what you're getting back? Whereas I know other podiatrists have got a really positive attitude, like they don't have a problem finding anybody. They go, in fact, we're turning people away. It's always been that way. And I'm going, is it the different mindset sometimes, I think, when it comes to actually finding the right team member and then somebody who wants to stay with you long term? Yeah. The first thing that pops into my head is I keep going back to pursuit of perfection, right? I always yeah. want to find the, the perfect person to complement our team. And you're never really going to find that, right? We never get there. But I think we're, uh, we're, we're selective enough that we're looking for a specific person like Patrick and I usually when we're when we're, we have an opening or we're looking for somebody, we have an idea of somebody that we want to find. And you're never going to necessarily find that exact person. So we're trying to find a diamond in the rough and things like that. But it's it's more difficult, I think, finding office staff right now and finding people that are personable and willing to work than I think it is finding docs. Because there's plenty of docs out there. There there are lots of docs that are going to be retiring soon. To me personally, I think it's a no-brainer entering into a private practice versus a hospital group because the market will consolidate at some point. It's only a matter of time and the private groups will get consolidated and it's a really good time to enter as a young doc because some of these older docs are going to sunset and they outnumber the younger docs and the, where are those patients going to go? If you can get into a, a practice like ours and that has the potential for a partnership and potential for equity pieces within the company and being able to make your own name and do your thing and not have somebody tell you how many patients you got to see in a specific amount of time and be RVU based. I hear that all the time. I don't want to be RVU based, but it's a good time. I think to have yeah. a private practice. But the interesting yeah. part too, is you said that you're planning this you know, two, three years out that when you're actually looking for someone, and I think part Have of to. the mistake with some podiatry clinics, they only start looking when they get desperate. When all of a sudden someone's going, oh, I'm resigning. And it's like, yeah, they react. I've now got to find a podiatrist, especially this time of year in Australia. It's like all the students have all graduated. Now everybody wants to get a, someone to start next year because the people that they've had there have resigned and are leaving and everybody's reacting instead of really planning ahead. And when I had my clinic, we used to actually, we'd take on a lot of students when they graduated, but we were signing them up at the end of their second last year. So we wouldn't wait till they were graduating to get them. We'd get them at the end of their third year and sign them up then. Got it. and we would pay Got them it. money over that final year so they didn't have to have a part-time job so they could just concentrate on what they had to do so that they could be the best podiatrist when they came out and that worked fantastic for us no, that's a great idea yeah you touched on being reactionary it's like when you're reacting to somebody leaving it's too late yeah. it takes six months to get credential where we're at minimum by then your patients are going and seeing somebody else yeah, in Australia, it is a, it's that reaction. Everybody, somebody leaves, and all of a sudden they go into panic mode. And I'm, I've tried, I've said to some people, sometimes maybe you don't need to employ anybody else. Maybe you just need to get rid of some of the crap work that you do, that nobody really wants to. Do. You're only employing someone to do the rubbish work. I so said, if you actually got rid of that yeah. and had a better clinic that ran better, had better quality patients, better quality work, you would actually then start attracting people. And, but it's, you got to slow down before you can speed up. No, and that makes total sense. And I think there's some history in podiatry to that, at least in America. If your thought as an owner is, I want to add someone on to unload some of the things I don't want to do, 
you're not going to be successful. And, yeah. and unfortunately, some people thought that way. And there were owners where they were thought of as associate mills and they'd get somebody for a couple of years and they'd burn them out and they'd go on to the next one. And that was their model. And they were okay with it. And podiatry got a little bit of a bad rap for it uh, just with the history. And, and we're trying to do the exact opposite of that. That's the last thing I want in our practice is, is somebody to think that we're trying to, as partners or owners and the guys that started the guys and gals that started the practice trying to unload the stuff that we don't want to do. I'll, yeah. I'll do anything. I'll tell you up front. We see each other's post-ops. We see each other's patients. I'm never going to complain that I, I, I didn't see Dr. X's. I saw Dr. X's post-op and I didn't make any money on it. I'm, it's not about that. It's about taking it's care of the true. patients the best way. So if you look at it that way, and I, I don't want, I'll never name names. There are docs where They'll do surgeries and they don't see their post-ops and they give them to their associates because the post-op visits don't make money. But how do you mm. connect with your, pa do you, you want that as a patient? I don't. No. I don't want to never see my surgeon afterwards. What if I have a complication? Who's going to take care of the complication? It's not going to be the surgeon that did the surgery. That makes no sense to me. Yeah. So that's, that's not how we run our practice, but we run our practice the way I think I would want to be treated and how I would treat my mother-in-law. And my my mother and my wife and my kids. Yeah, it's funny because when, when I look at different practices, I'll, I'll see some practices <clears> where they will employ anybody, anyone that can put a hat on this. Is there a podiatrist? Mm -hmm. It's just a warm body to fill a chair, and they're happy with that. But then they're having to replace them every twelve months or every two years. They're yeah. struggling to find somebody else. The owner of the business does all the good stuff, and the people they employ do all the stuff they don't want to do. Then I've seen other clinics where they will have these standards where they only see a certain type of patients and problems. They have a, a thing that you have to have at least three years experience working before they'll even employ you. Uh, whoever starts with them will see the same number and type of patients as what the owner will. And what's interesting is that person is turning people away. They said, we're getting too many people apply for jobs because the word of mouth and reputation has got around that they are a great place to work with. And podiatry in Australia, it's a small world. Everybody knows who not to work for. And the graduates that come out, because I've got, I've got an episode that I'm producing at the moment, putting it together, comes out in uh, January. It's going to be episode 310, and it's how I chose my employer. And I'm talking to new graduates, and it's surprising. Some of these went for six or ten different interviews, and, it's, and I'm talking about how they chose that sure. particular person. And... Oh, it's an eye opener. Very interesting. <laughs> it, it, it's a, it's going to be an eye opener, I think, for some podiatrists that are yeah. employed. I'm going to turn it. I'm going to tune into that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, let's go back a step because I didn't ask you at the beginning. What got you into podiatry in the first place? It's a good question. Yeah, I knew I wanted to do medicine. Wasn't sure what type of medicine I wanted to do. I, initially, I started it at Marquette as a physical therapy student, and I wanted to be in sports medicine. I. Taking even a further step back before I even got to Marquette, I thought I wanted to be on the business side of sports, and I wanted to do. I wanted to go to Michigan's business sports business management program, and decided ah, I like the medicine part. Physical therapy is really cool, and then I looked at physical therapy, and I saw I've always I've always had the drive to go next level. Yeah, and if I don't see a next level, I I, I don't want to be complacent. But I don't want to. And, and physical therapy, I love it, but y y you cap yourself at a certain point, unless you're you know, going to be one of the bigger physical therapy groups in our area is Athletico. Unless you're going to be an Athletico type where you have dozens of clinics, you're capping yourself. And I looked at that and then I, I got into the operating room and I fell in love with it. Yeah. And I knew that I, I didn't want to just do physical therapy. I wanted to do some kind of surgery. And then I started trying to look at, all right, what kind of sports medicine can I do? But I don't want to be pigeonholed into just sports medicine because I, I like all kinds of medicine. And what attracted me to podiatry is I can pretty much do anything. I can do dermatology. I can do sports medicine. We can do micro nerve surgery. I've taught myself after residency to do micro nerve surgery. We can do all kinds of stuff. And the thing that I think probably pushed me over the edge is I had a Achilles injury and then I had a complication. I got a MRSA abscess right before I, I entered podiatry school. When I had the surgeon fixing my Achilles, I had the same guy managing the infection and doing the wound care. And it just, it was attractive to me to, to have the same person doing everything. And I ended up 
going into podiatry school the next year and I never looked back. So where did you end up studying? So the Chicago school. So Rosalind okay. Franklin, which is Shoal College of Podiatric Medicine. So this whole Illinois area where you are, you've pretty much been there your whole life. Yeah, I didn't go very far. Yeah, one of one of my biggest regrets, and you'll go back to this after you you went to that tailgate with us. I, I wish yeah. I would have gone to an SEC school for undergrad. It would have been a much better <laughs> have been a much better <laughs> experience than being in the cold of Milwaukee and <laughs> in uh. Marquette. But I loved Marquette. Don't get me wrong. But it's no it's no Southern football school. Uh, <laughs> but no, I pretty much stayed in Chicago. I mean, the farthest I got for school was Milwaukee. So. We Residency, I stayed in Chicago as well. Yeah, we call Milwaukee our, our northernmost suburb. <laughs> yeah, where, where, where's the Green Bay Packers? It's, uh, it's, it's a little farther north than Milwaukee. So it's, it's right, still in okay. Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and, so what not do you too say, far off. and what do you say when you go under the bridge again at the Bears game? <laughs> Green Bay Sox. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they said a little bit more than that. Over but, and over. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they did. That, that was, um, <laughs> yeah. When I got back from uh, America this year, I did an episode, yeah, my takeaways from my 2023 USA trip. And I do talk about the tailgating thing we went to when we went watch the Bears uh, play in the NFL. And I did tailgating with you, which I have never done before. And anyone who doesn't know what tailgating is, it's 10,000 people turn up in a car park, bring out barbecues five hours before a game, and they just start drinking and have a good time and eat. Most amazing thing I've ever yeah. done in a sporting event. Yeah, it's a social experience, right? You get some people put TVs out and you get a later game. You watch the earlier games. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, and so, then as you get in the colder weather, you start to bond over how cold it is. And it, it gets to be who's the stronger man try, willing to brave the cold. You get your pieces of cardboard to put under your feet so your feet don't freeze to the concrete in the stadium, right? Oh, I can't imagine it being that You didn't cold. experience that one. No, it was actually, it, we had a beautiful day. It was summer shining. So yeah. It was cold. Yeah, you got lucky. It was cold. Yeah, but it, it was a little chilly, freezing. but it was, yeah, it was like low 50s. And that was nothing in Chicago. I grew up with my dad having season tickets to the Bears. And uh, yeah, it, it would get cold. It would get really cold. <laughs> You're your hand freezes to your soda when you're sitting at the game or something like that. It's yeah, it got yeah. cold. That's just crazy. But with the the game itself, like there was Patrick, yourself and Remy, and you invited me mm -hmm. along with you. So throughout the whole season, do you use that to bring guests along to games at certain times? And you use that as a, as a bit of a marketing thing as well? Yeah, we do. So that's, it's something that we kind of use the tickets is we try to bring, we try to bring docs, we try to bring people that we have good relationships with, whether it's referral sources or, or other uh, business associates. So yeah, it's definitely used as a marketing tool, but it's also used as a, a team building tool, right? That's probably the bigger arm for our practice of, we routinely throw out, it's who wants to go now, because it's an all day thing, to be honest, that yeah. we're hoping they move to Arlington, which is... 15 minutes away from where I live right now. That's the talk right now for the Chicago Bears. But until then, it's an hour and a half to get down there and two hours to get back. None of us really want to do every home game. So it's we open it up to the whole group. And, yeah, I think and it's a good idea. Try to get other people to go and experience what you experienced. The, that's um, something that's important to us. So when you're inviting guests, you or you try and do the tailgating thing as well. Yeah, you know, like you try and make it a whole day yeah. experience, not just we try oh, to. Let's, let's just we go and watch to. the game and yeah. then leave. It's hey, yeah. let's yeah. enjoy the tailgating experience. Drinking is optional, mm -hmm. and then after the game, everyone starts eating and drinking again. But that was interesting. Yeah. We had the same thing. We used to have a our in Cairns where I live. Uh, mm -hmm. Our team is in the National Basketball League. So we used to have a, a corporate box, eight-seat corporate box at, at the basketball games. And it wasn't cheap to have it, but the I think they used to have 14 or 15 home games that we would go to. And I would say probably 50% of the tickets were always used just for, with our own team members. And everyone yeah. just loved the basketball season. We'd all pile along there. You'd have a bit of food, a few drinks. And it was a real bonding thing between the podiatrists, the front office staff, and then we'd invite sometimes friends, sometimes other doctors in the area that you were hoping to just build a better relationship with. It's all about team building and creating a good environment and an environment that people want to work in and want to stay. 
it's a hard landscape right now. We were talking about how hard it is to find people and some people it's hard to find people. Other people, it's not hard to find people. And the people that don't struggle to find people are probably the ones that are doing it the best, right? Yeah. Towards the end of me owning the clinic, we had a box at the football, we had a box at the basketball. And as a group, we did so many things together. And I remember when the people that I sold my practice to, and they were looking at what I was paying everyone, they said, you don't pay huge wages. Yeah, you know, it's not that you're underpaying them, but you're just paying just normal wages for your, for your podiatrist. Mm -hmm. So I said, yeah, that's right. And they went, how do you keep them? And I said, because we do so many things together, they get so many extra things that they get that they're not having to pay tax on. These are just little bonus things that we do as a group of mm -hmm. basketball, football and all that. And they're going, oh, okay. After I sold my clinic to them, they gave everybody a pay rise, but they got rid of the corporate boxes at the football and at the basketball and dropped everything else that we were doing. And I think within six or nine months, not one of the podiatrists that worked for me was there anymore. They all left. Mm. And I'm like, wow, isn't, isn't Telling, that right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's what you said there. It's the, the businesses that look after their team and do things together. You've, you form this culture in that business. And I was reading a statistic just recently and it said a business that has a really good team culture only has like a 14% turnover rate of staff. A business that has no team culture has a 50% turnover rate of staff. Yeah, no, it's telling. That's and that in that in the workforce too. You really do. If you, if it's not a place you you want to stay at, you're not going to stay. There's there's so many people that are hiring. Everybody's hiring, right? And if you're not if you're not a place where people want to be and want to stay, they're not going to stay. It's that simple. It's not rocket science. You create an atmosphere that you would want to live in. Yeah. And I've like prior to podiatry, I had some really crazy jobs working. Yeah. Like at stack, stacking shelves, that was a normal job, but also worked at the mm -hmm. different types of meat, meat works, working with pigs and sheep and cattle and chickens. Had some terrible oh, jobs. Boy. Yeah. But I also had some really great bosses in some of those places. And it's surprising in some of the places that I've worked that were like more privately owned, those that really looked after the team, these people had been there five, 10, 15, 20 years. They just didn't leave. Whereas some of the other mm -hmm. ones where the boss was a bit of a hard ass that was all about profits and not about the team. It was just a constant turnover. Field. People didn't stay there very long at all. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's telling, right? It's if you create an atmosphere that you want to stay at, you're going to stay. Yeah. Yeah, I said that you to know, Patrick I, I, uh... when I was there. When we were there and we were at the football, I'd had a few drinks by then. And I said to Patrick, I'd love to come and work with you guys. <laughs> Patrick goes, well, we might be able to arrange that somehow, even though I can't yeah. take you work as a podiatrist over there. <laughs> I said, but oh, maybe, right. we, maybe you could work in, with the marketing side of things. And it's because I felt the bond that you guys all had working together. It was just it was something unique about it that I thought it was really good to see. And I do know other podiatry clinics in Australia that are like that. Yeah. And, and one thing you taught on about bosses that you learned from and that you, that shaped you, you know, I, I was, it spurred something for me. I interned before, while I was still trying to figure out whether I wanted to go into business or medicine, I interned at a private equity group in Chicago and the managing partner of the group was this guy who he slept four hours a night and he was... He had a mind like a steel trap. He never forgot anything. He could walk into a room and light up the room and he just never stopped. And probably still to this day, smartest guy I think I've ever been around. Yeah. Look and go, all right, this guy's going to make something of himself. No matter what, he might fail 10 times, but he's going to succeed once. And that's all it takes. In the end. Yeah, exactly. And and I looked at it and I came to the realization of, I see you succeed in high school and college and sports and whatever, but there's always somebody smarter than you. There's always somebody faster than you. There's oh, always yeah. somebody that is more personable than you and more social than you. There's always somebody better looking than you, right? You're never the highest, right? So it was the whole pursuit of perfection, not to keep saying it, but it's just, you look and go, okay, all right, I'm not the smartest person in the room. And this guy can walk in, never have seen a slide deck that I spent 50 hours putting together for a pitch, didn't yeah. look at it once, knew it better than I did when he gave the presentation. And I'm sitting there going, who is this guy? I just, and it was, it was telling. And, and of course he, he 
did really well with himself and he's, he's succeeding in business. It's important. The guys that, the, the leaders that we come up with, whether it's in business or sports or life, they're the ones that shape our personalities, the yeah. ones that make a mark on us. It's true. Like I've got some close friends that I do. I Every time I'm with them, I just leave with the biggest smile on my face and I can't mm -hmm. wait till I see him again because mm -hmm. he just, yeah. you always leave. It's like when I was with you three in October and yeah, when you dropped me back at the hotel, I was very sad when I got out of the car. I wanted to stay in the car with you for the rest of the, for the hour and a half. I remember, yeah. I was going back. <laughs> Take me with you. I'll get the train back. Yeah, right. Because yeah, right. just the, oh, I don't know what we were talking about, but the laughter in the car, it's just, it's one of those things that you know, when you find people that you really click with, and I've got a lot of friends in the States that are like that. Yeah, in Milwaukee, you guys in Chicago, Nashville, yeah, Philadelphia, all around the place that, they're just people that you love being around and you feel good when you're around them and you always live better for the experience. And I think everybody needs to find those people in their life. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Uh, get a one. It's, and hey, some of it's trial and error. You go yeah. out and it's some people you click with and some people you don't. It's when you're, I, I like to tell some of the newer docs that come on when people ask me, why are, why are you successful? Why do your patients like you? And I, I tell them, it, it's not me being better than you or smarter than you. It's if I'm having a bad day, none of my patients know about it. When I go into that room, it's I shut off. I have... I'm the happiest person in the room from the second I leave to the second I walk out. And patients, patients that have been with me for a long time, they can tell, oh, okay, what's up? You're not your typical self. But most people, you can't drag, everybody's not having a bad day. Every, everybody's not having a good day every single day, right? Mm, it's true. You can't drag it in with you because then it just rubs off on people and it's not going to be a place that they want to come back to. I think that's really probably one of the most important things that you know, you can do as a, as a doc. And I don't think people put enough emphasis on that. Just treat people the way you'd want to be treated and, and make people feel better, not just less pain, but feel better leaving your office and you're going to succeed no matter what. Yeah. I posted something about that recently in one, in Facebook group and yeah, just saying that you don't want to be that person. Yeah. The person that people see coming and everyone just starts going in a different direction. Because mm -hmm. they're like, oh, no, here comes the thing. I let you just know the conversation is going to take a downward turn. They couldn't have been at your house, gone down the shops and come back without there being a negative story or something happening right. in there, some drama. And you're like, you don't want to be dragged into it. So I think you've got to find that circle of positivity, whether you need to have it at work. And if it's not, a, if you're an employee and you're working somewhere and it's just not a positive environment, I recommend you get out. And agree with that more. Yeah. And if you're the, if you're questioning owner, it, you yeah. probably should get out. Yeah. yeah. If you're the owner of the business, you're surrounded by negative people. And I've had someone recently I was talking to who just said, well, no one in my business actually listens to me. I hate being at my own business. And I said, but you chose them. I said you employed them. Yeah. Right. You get what you tolerate. You obviously you tolerated this. I said, should have made the changes a while back, but slowly now, hopefully they're making those changes. I remember one of my receptionists, and we were out once and we were pretty good friends. And she introduced me as, oh, this is my boss, Tyson. And I went, I said, yeah, how are you doing? And then I pulled her aside. I said, from now on, whenever we're out socially or doing anything, can you just introduce me as, this is Tyson. I work with him at Pro Arch Podiatry. I don't need to be labeled as your boss. Just mm -hmm. I, I'm some, we work together at the clinic. Yes, I might own it, but we work here. And that was... One of the culture things that we tried to bring in that if we were all out socially doing anything, we all worked at Pro Arch Podiatry. We worked yep. together. I wasn't the I, boss and you I weren't I couldn't agree employee. with that more. Yeah. Yeah, it's important. It's It just all comes back to team building and to developing that culture and having everybody feel like they have a say, not just feel like they have a say, whether it's in business or it's social. And yeah, I don't, I'm with you. I'm less... It's less, the hierarchy is less important to me, especially when you're out socially and it's, we're friends, not mm. I'm your boss and you're my employee. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Which goes back to what I originally said when I met you, that I did not know that you were a partner in the business because you didn't, you never were introduced to me or you never came up and said, hi, I'm Dr. Peter Lovato and I'm a partner with Patrick. 
I just knew you worked with Patrick and because Patrick had been on the podcast so much, we never really spoke about partnerships or, or what was happening. So I just assumed Patrick was a head honcho. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But he never said, he I am the head honcho. Did everything. <laughs> and and right. I can see how you guys, why you all work together so well, because you've all got on. But yeah, it's sometimes I think in, in every profession, people have egos and we're, mm -hmm. and they want to show how important they are. Or I've written 25 peer reviewed articles and they'll make sure, hi, I'm John and I've written 25 peer reviewed articles. <laughs> they want to tell you what they've done. Right. Yeah. I, and I still have 50 peer reviewed articles. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. But, <laughs> but no, I, I don't flaunt it. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, but it's, that's part of the, it's part of, right. Yeah. Just, yeah. Not <laughs> almost, but it's part of what I think attracted me to taking a job with Patrick in the first place. It's yeah. he's, he, I really saw a lot of myself in him. He checks his ego at the door and he is by far the most upfront employer that I've seen in podiatry professionally behind the curtains, even with our contracts, we're so upfront with our docs almost to a fault because we're not having these complicated formulas that, you know, uh, that try to figure out ways to make your compensation look better than it actually is. We're trying yeah. to be upfront and just something as simple as that. And I, I hope that people respect that because I did looking at the contract and, and, and talking to them and things like that. But I, I saw a lot of my own personality in him and go back to bosses that impressed me. I saw a lot of the, the boss at the private equity group, the managing partner's name was Ahmed. And, and I saw a lot of him in Patrick and that made me feel comfortable about joining his group because I, I was coming out and I didn't want to just be a, I would have joined with an orthopedic group that didn't have a path to partnership, or I would have joined with a hospital group that I would be employee for the rest of my life. If I didn't want to be a partner and be involved in the business and help shape the business in the future and run the behind the scenes, that, that was important to me as well. Not just the medicine, because I, I had a little bit of both coming out in terms of experience and I wanted to do both. And yeah. I saw a lot of that in Patrick. Yeah. That's why we clicked. And that's, I hope that the docs that we bring on feel the same way because the path is there. Patrick's going to listen to this. Patrick's going to listen to this and go, God, I'm a top bloke. <laughs> but he, he is, is. He's, he is. He's a top bloke. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. You, you can't fault him. Like I said, every time I've had him on the podcast, the, few times we've met now, yeah, like face to face, yeah, in the flesh. He's just, what he sounds like on the podcast is exactly what he's like. And I always tell people, if you're ever overseas or in America or in the UK and you've listened to a guest on this podcast and you're in the town that they're in, reach out to them. I'm yet Please, to have, yeah. I, I'm yet to have anyone on this podcast that I would say would not accept an email or a phone call from someone to say, hey, I'm in town. Do you want to catch up and have a coffee? I heard you on the podcast. And if everybody did that, the the web and connection that we'd end up creating oh, yeah. would oh, it'd just be amazing. I had last week's episode, when I was doing that one, we were talking about a conference that they're going to in the States. It's, I think it's a foot and ankle surgery conference you got in February. Oh, ACFAST? Yeah. Yeah. American College of Foot and Ankle Surgery. It's in Tampa yeah. this year. Yeah. yeah. So we were talking about that. Matthew Shikero, last week's episode, was talking about that. And I said, oh... I said, I know a few people over that might be going to it. So I put him in touch with Remy. And now the, oh, two of them, the two of them have chatted and they're going to actually meet at the conference. And I'm thinking, great. it's so good even seeing your guests that are actually uh, connecting with each other. Yeah, I'm going too. I'll probably meet them too. Meet and him. that's great. I love I love connecting with, I, I do, I mentor students at the, uh, at the school I went to and I'm, Obviously, I think you mentioned at the beginning, I'm the educational director of our fellowship and I'm in a couple of different residency programs. I love teaching as well. So it's, it's fun to, to not just give back, but to help people to find themselves within this profession, because mm. I didn't know what I wanted to do and, and specifically what type of podiatrist I wanted to be when I was in school. And I had people that kind of helped shape that whether it was in podiatry or whether it was in, in other business aspects. It's great. Having a bigger web, it's only a good thing. Yeah, it's I think only it's a good. good. Thing, having more connections. Yeah, I just, like the other night, I did a talk for the Australian Podiatry Association, just a, a business talk on 
you know, run through, not to the end of 2023. I received an email yesterday from one of the universities in Canada. I want to know, can I do a Zoom call with their final year students? So I'm going to do a talk on transitioning into private practice. Cool. Very cool. Uh, received an email from Padaish on the Gold Coast about setting up a, a group down there where they can all connect with each other. And you just go, it's just, it is, this is a big web. And I think the more we can interact, yes, in some places you are competitors, but you're not competitive with everybody. So try and connect with as many podiatrists as you can. And I don't know, it just makes us all stronger. Oh yeah. Some of my closest friends are quote unquote competitors in yeah. our area. And part of the reason we're friends is because we're up front with each other and we help each other. And if we see something that's off, we're going to let the other one know. And it's, it, we're not in this to destroy each other. We're in this to help each other, right? The rising mm. tide floats all boats. It's for the good of the profession. If our profession does better, then we all do better. It's part of the reason why I'm on the executive board and of the Illinois Podiatric Medical Association right now, because I really do think that if we stick together and if we do a better job of marketing as a whole and do a better job of just coming together as a profession, everybody benefits. And and we're not competitors, we're co-workers, whether we work yeah. for the same group or not, we're all in it together. Yeah. When I had my clinic in Cairns, there was one other podiatry clinic that was the only other one that I actually got on with. Kyle, if you're listening, it was, you know that. And what was interesting, I remember we were at an event one day and I just said to him, I said, between nine to five, when we're in our own, when we're actually in our business, I said, I think the example I gave him, we're like cage fighters. We're both in the cage, has been closed and we've got a job to do. It's not, there's nothing personal, we, we do the job. I said, but when they open that cage and you walk out, we're human beings, right. we're adults and we should be able to get on, talk, uh, socially without any problems whatsoever. And he agreed. And what's really interesting, there has been a lot of podiatrists in the area who I've just never gotten along with. They've never wanted to have anything to do with me. He was the only one that did. And now that I, I don't have my practice anymore, what, who's the, got the biggest clinic in Cairns? Kyle does. And there's a reason for that. Because when you're a nice person and you want to work with other people, it, it, you just can't help but be successful. But if you want to try and keep everything yourself and everybody is a competitor and you don't want to let anybody in and you want to be mean and nasty or say things about them, then it's a very small, world, sad world to, to be in, to be that way. Yeah. Yeah. Put, yeah. I, I, yeah. Absolutely. We're all fighting against each other. Nobody wins. Yeah. But anyway, before we finish up, I'm going to ask oh, one last question for you. Do you have a, a bit of advice? Anyone who's listening to this podcast at the moment? And there's people that there's new graduates, there's people who've been out for a while, there's people who've been out 20, 30 years who listen to the show. What's one piece of advice you give them just about their career, or just moving forward or being a happier podiatrist? Yeah. So to me, it's never stop learning, right? Never stop, never limit yourself, never look at it and say, I didn't get this training. I don't feel comfortable doing that. This day and age, I hear that a lot. In this day and age, you can learn it. You can, you can go to an, one of the orthopedic implant companies and say, hey, I want to learn how to do this. And they will bring a consultant and, and teach you how to do it. Or you can go to courses. If you want to do something, even if you didn't get the residency training, or you can join a group where some of the attendings that have been around longer are willing to show you. I know and with our group, that's one thing that we really pride ourselves on is if we have an associate coming in that doesn't know how to do it specific procedure or their product of COVID. Unfortunately, we've seen a lot of that right now and they just didn't get the numbers in residency. Come in our group and we'll scrub our cases. And the other thing that I think is is really important to enjoying yourself is become an expert in billing and coding. That was one thing that, that Patrick really instilled in me. And I, I came in wanting that, but I had a resource at the practice that knew way more than I did. And yeah. I, I thought I knew a decent amount. And now I teach and lecture on building and coding. It's, it's, a, it's an arm. It's the business arm. It's not just medicine. Obviously, we, most of us got into this for medicine and to be social. If you're not getting compensated for what you do, it's hard to stomach. It's mm. hard to keep going on. Having that extensive knowledge of building and coding, which always changes. So you always got to stay up on it really makes things different so that you can be successful. You can have a practice where you don't have to burn yourself out just to pay your student loans back. You get paid for what you do. 
when it's important, but it's also finding that balance, right? It's that's important. And it's a buzzword nowadays for a reason of having that work-life balance and making sure that you're not neglecting your family and you're working enough. And me and Patrick and I, we work a lot and we don't yeah. have an off switch. And if we could work 25 hours in a day, we would probably if, if we didn't have to sleep, but, I'm, but then I'm the same. you, know, you got to give yourself a break. Yeah. You got to give yourself a break. And uh, yeah, I guess coming out is be discerning in the job that you pick and make sure that you're not just looking at the contract. I think I see a lot of people that are just interested in numbers going, oh, okay, this one's slightly better than the other one. I'm going to take that one. And then they realize, oh, I'm miserable. I got a little more money, but I'm in a miserable situation. We talked for a while about the, you know, the atmosphere of the culture, right? Make sure you know what you're getting into. And if you have the chance, go out and have a dinner, have a beer or a soda or whatever. And with the people that are hiring you and do something social because you, you got to know what you're getting into. Otherwise, I see too many people that have bounced around from job to job and are miserable. And then they're not able to get their board numbers in the US and it's a mess. I got so, lucky enough yeah. to find the first job and I never had to look back. Been at one job my whole career. But what you said about the billing and coding like that especially applies in America. In Australia, does, we yeah. in Australia we don't have as many issues. But it's really important to understand what code you can use, what code you can't use. How much does this particular health fund give when people have this particular cover? And every year we would contact the health funds. We'd find out what's changed. Are there new codes that we can use? And we were mm -hmm. always on top of that. We wouldn't just assume. And I remember one particular time, this is one code that I mentioned it to a few podiatrists that were totally unaware of it. I remember one of them saying to me, just that one code alone will add an extra twenty twenty five thousand dollars $25,000 to our clinic. Oh, so yeah. They yeah. go, and totally unaware that we could even use that code. And legitimately, it's not just adding it on for something to do. It was a legitimate code that they could use in the time. Yeah, Patrick and I, the past few years have, when things slow down in January, typically with us in the US with the deductible system, yeah. uh, in January, February, things slow down and it's conference season. We'll typically pick a group that's similar in size to us in private that's willing to host us and go and just pick their brains because all we need is one tidbit, one thing, one thing that they do that we don't do that we can institute and it's worth the whole trip and more. Oh. And with billing and coding, what I see is podiatry as a whole in the U.S., we don't, majority of podiatrists don't know how to bill. They don't know how to collect on what they make appropriately. Mm -hmm. They're missing things. And I think some of the, the hybrid orthopedic training that I got taught me that and taught me what you can and can't do. And then some of it was Patrick, who was a little bit of a mentor for me in the beginning. And now we're more equals, but it didn't start out that way. He was my first, he was my first boss. But like you said, he'll be the first person to say, hey, don't call me boss, because that's just who we are. Very similar. Now no, find a thought, group that you're comfortable with. But the other thing you said that I thought was really important was continue, be on the continual path of learning. But if you mm -hmm. end up Look, over here in Australia, some people end up in a job where they're just in routine podiatry and they'll complain after two years, oh, I've lost all my MSK, my biomechanical skills. And whenever I hear that, I think, no, you chose to lose mm -hmm. your biomechanical skills. Even if you're doing routine foot care day in, day out, that's eight hours a day. You still have another 16 hours in the day that mm -hmm. you can attend events, watch things online, connect with other people. It, when you have holiday breaks is go and visit other podiatrists and, and hone those skills. So if you've lost your biomechanical skills or whatever the skill is, the only person you can blame is yourself because you have the time to get better at it. Yeah. I couldn't agree with that more. And, and the other piece of advice would be as busy as you get, don't ever stop marketing. Oh, you know, yeah. Don't ever stop. Don't ever, don't get complacent. I see, I see, don't have the mindset of, I see five, 600 patients a month and I do all these surgeries and I don't need to market. I'm above that now because I'm established in practice. It just, that's not how the world works and you will slow down. Mm. Um, it's the second principle you know, unless of you're... the, but what is it, the second principle of the red queen hypothesis? Okay. Yeah. If you slow, I'm not familiar it, with that one. <laughs> it's about, <laughs> it, if you, if you're standing still, you're actually falling behind. There you go. Okay. Yeah, fair it's, enough. Yeah, it's a thing in the environment. But when you say that about marketing, when people say, oh, but I don't need to market anymore. Yeah, I'm really busy. Why does McDonald's 
continue to market? Why does Coca Cola right. continue continue to market? These are massive brands, but they know if they stop marketing, then they will let another competitor into that mm -hmm. space. If they don't continue to own that space, somebody else will come in and take it. So if McDonald's Absolutely. stopped all advertising, Burger King would ramp it up. Mm -hmm. Pepsi would ramp it up. Yeah. And I think Absolutely. they actually I think there was I'm pretty sure I read whether it was in the eighties or something, Coca-Cola thought they were untouchable and they did actually drop some of their marketing, a lot of their marketing. And it was at the same time Pepsi really hit the market and started marketing. And Coca-Cola almost shit themselves. Yeah. <laughs> they realized that they, me. they had to actually start marketing again, but they lost a big piece of the market share because they waited too long. Yeah. It's just, it's the way the world works. If you become, like you said, if you become complacent, you slowly die. Yeah. And that's with not just markets, with your podiatry skills, it's with everything. You just got to, yeah. you just keep mastering your craft. Yeah. You got it. Never so, stop learning. Okay, Pete. This has been fantastic. I want to thank you for coming on the Podiatry Legends podcast, sharing sharing your wisdom with us. And this has been a lot of fun. It's been fun catching up again too, reminiscing. Always. Uh, reminiscing about what we Always. got up to in Chicago. It was fun. So thank you very yeah. much. Next time you're in the US, where to find us? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> we gotta I... come. We gotta come visit you in Australia. That's on the docket. We're, oh yeah. Uh, we'll use Remy as a tour guide and and get out there. That's definitely on the list. He can help you speak the language. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, okay, thanks for that. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Okay, bye. All right, take care.